Good morning, everyone. My name is Megan McDermott. I use she, her pronouns, and I work at the BC Civil Liberties Association as the policy director. I'm gonna be moderating today's press conference. Before we begin our event, I would like to acknowledge that the BC Civil Liberties Association is based on the stolen and unceded Coast Salish territory and the shared lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. As we're all joining virtually, I recognize some members may be joining from many different territories, and we recognize the shared history of colonization across these territories. We have several speakers lined up to talk about the fight to end immigration detention and to react to British Columbia's historic decision to end its immigration detention agreement with the, Can with the Canada Border Services Agency, also known as the CBSA. The agreement currently allows CBSA to incarcerate migrant and refugee claimants on purely administrative grounds in provincial jails. On July 21st, 2022, the province announced it will give CBSA 12 months notice to stop this practice. To ensure that everyone can fully participate in today's conference, I would like to review some housekeeping. This event will be recorded and live streamed to the BCCLA YouTube. Please feel free to turn on your webcams if you are comfortable doing so. You can start and stop your video by clicking on the video camera icon in the taskbar below. You will also be muted for the duration of the speaker portion, but you should be able to chat with everyone in the chat box. You can see the chat box by clicking on the icon that looks like a little speech bubble on the taskbar at the bottom of your screen. You can also use the chat to ask questions throughout the event or during the question and answers or if you have any technical issues. For further tech support, or if you're joining by phone, you can email info at bccla.org. During the question and answer portion of the conference, we ask that you raise your hand to indicate to our staff that you'd like to be unmuted. You can do so by selecting the reactions button and then the raise hand button. For folks on the phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. If you're on the computer and, ha and having audio issues, you can switch to phone audio by clicking on the arrow next to the microphone icon and selecting leave computer audio. Then click phone call for dial-in info and select the flag for your country's dial-in number. We also have provided captioning and ASL for this conference. Our ASL interpreter has been spotlighted along with our speakers. If you're having trouble seeing ASL, seeing the ASL interpreter, please get in touch either through the chat function or by emailing info at bccla.org. If you would like to turn on the captioning, you can select the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and enable the captioning by selecting show subtitle. If you, request, if you require a transcript from this event, please reach out to info at bccla.org. After we hear from our speakers, we'll, we'll open the floor for journalists to ask questions. If you are a journalist, please change your name in Zoom to your first and your last name and the outlet that you are with if you have not done so already. I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers for today. Today, we are joined by Marissa Landers, Policy Staff Council Community with BC Civil Liberties Association, Abdelrahman Almadi, a person with lived experience in immigration detention, Samra Muscati, Associate Director, Disability Rights Division, Human Rights Watch, Julia Sand, Human Rights Law and Policy Campaigner, Amnesty International. Omar Chu, Community Legal Worker, Immigration and Refugee Legal Clinic. Dr. Mei-Ling Wiedemeyer from the Center for Gender and Sexual Health Equities Department of Family Practice at UBC. We have Elle Jones, award-winning poet, journalist, professor, and activist. 
And we have Sarah Maria Gomez Lopez, a person with lived experience in immigration detention. The historic decision follows the province's review of its immigration detention agreement, as well as a long period of advocacy, including submissions to the BC government during its review of the contract, a 14 days of action campaign in May, and statements to Vancouver City Council in June that resulted in a unanimous vote calling on the province of BC to stop jailing immigration detainees. The advocacy was brought together by a coalition of people with lived experience in immigration detention and BC groups, including some that you'll hear from today, and many more, including BC Poverty Reduction Coalition, BC Prisoner Legal Services, BC General Employees Union, Community Legal Assistance Society, Justice for Girls, Migrant Workers Center BC, Migrant BC, Pivot Legal Society, Rainbow Refugee, SWAN, Vast, and West Coast Leaf. Our first speaker today is Marissa Landers, Staff Council Community for the BC CLA. I've had the pleasure of working with Mara on the issue of immigration detention since she joined BC CLA. Good morning, everyone. We are here today to mark a historic development in the journey to abolish immigration detention in Canada. Thursday, July 21st, the Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General in BC announced its decision to terminate its agreement with Canada Border Services Agency, which allowed immigrants and refugee claimants to be detained in provincial jails and subjected to myriad human rights abuses. This decision follows extensive advocacy that brought to light the lived experience of detainees and the ways in which Canada's immigration detention regime violates international human rights law, which has long held that immigration detention should only be used as a measure of last resort. In 2015, the United Nations Human Rights Committee expressed grave concern about Canada's immigration detention regime, as well as its prison conditions and recommended that Canada should stop indefinitely detaining immigrants and refugees and should rely only on non-custodial measures. The province's agreement with CBSA exemplifies the tiered system of double punishment and incarceration that defines Canadian immigration law. Immigrants and refugee claimants face not only the threat of losing their status in Canada, but also the deprivation of liberty and inhumane treatment that defines our prison system. Under the provincial agreement, detainees are regularly handcuffed, shackled, and held with little to no contact with the outside world in the, some of the country's most restrictive confinement conditions, including maximum security provincial jails and solitary confinement. An external audit commissioned by the chair of the Immigration and Refugee Board in 2018 also found that detainees experienced a persistent lack of mental health treatment and counseling services in provincial correctional institutions. CBSA itself has previously noted its inability to oversee and ensure human rights compliant conditions and practices in non-CBSA facilities. Immigration detainees are people who come to Canada seeking safety or a better life. Over the past five years, Canada has detained tens of thousands of individuals under immigration law while they await the resolution of their immigration or refugee matters, including children, survivors of severe trauma or persecution, and persons with disabilities, including mental health conditions. In making their decision, the province has prioritized the rights of these individuals and acknowledged the atrocities they have faced within this cruel carceral system. The decision is also a critical repudiation of immigration detention as a whole. While we are heartened that BC has upheld the safety and dignity of immigrants and refugees in this instance, we want to emphasize that this is still a first step. We expect that the province and CBSA will adhere to the ample 12 month transition timeline and that BC will not be persuaded to extend its complicity in this regime any further. Meanwhile, the advocate will continue in other provinces. It is our hope that BC will set an example for the rest of the country and that each province will terminate its agreement with CBSA, in turn increasing pressure on our federal government to abolish immigration detention altogether. We also want to emphasize that the cessation of provincial jails as a sustaining resource for this system is not an opportunity for CBSA to increase its number of immigration holding centers 
or to rely on restrictive detention alternatives, such as ankle monitors or curfews. BCCLA will continue to work alongside all of those present today, as well as the rest of fellow advocates to hold state actors accountable and to protect and advance the human rights of all of those seeking to call this place home. To Sarah, Abdulrahman, and all of those with lived experience, it is thanks to you, thanks to your expertise, your courage, and your vulnerability that we are able to expose and dismantle these systems. Thank you for trusting us to work alongside you. Thank you. Mara, <clears throat> Mara thank you for speaking so clearly about the decision to end the CBSA agreement and its impacts. We're now gonna to turn to our second speaker, Abdul Rahman Al Mahdi. Hello, uh, my name is Abdul Rahman Al Mahdi. I would like to share some personal reflection about this important victory for human rights in BC. I arrived in Canada in 2017 to seek refugee protection. I fled from Egypt because I, as a human rights activist, my life was in danger. When I landed at Vancouver International Airport, I was filled with hope and anticipation. But instead of finding freedom, I was arrested without charge. I was handcuffed and shackled. My belongings were taken away, including the rechargeable battery to my hearing aid. You know, I have a hearing disability and I depend on hearing aid. Without them, I'm in complete silence. Within hours of arriving in Canada, I was in jail. I was confused and scared. I had to try navigating through jail with a language barrier and I could not hear anyone or anything. I didn't know why I was arrested and detained. I didn't know why I was put in handcuffs. I didn't know why I was in jail. I didn't know how long I would be there. I didn't know how I could ask these basic questions. I didn't know who I could trust. I spent my first night in Canada in Vancouver jail. My faith in Canada was silently shattered and I was alone in jail and in silence. This will always be my introduction to Canada. I spent the following two months in three jails in BC. I, and I never know when I would be released. I spent most of my time in jail in silence because I was only provided with one hearing aid battery at a time and only for CBSA meetings and hearings. The batteries was run out after a few hours. I was repeatedly handcuffed and shackled and strip searched. This was absolutely humiliating and terrifying and I had no idea why I was there. I just cried. Today, I continue to live in Vancouver and I have to come to feel that this is my home. For most of my life, I could only dream of human rights when BC decided in the name of human rights to stop jailing immigrants and detainees. This, this feels like a major achievement it gives me a lot of hope for the rest of Canada as well. I hope that other provinces will follow BC example and that other people coming to this country will receive a more humane introduction. Thank you.
Thank you, Abdel Rahman, for sharing your experiences and the impact of immigration detention. We're deeply appreciative of your vulnerability in speaking about such personal matters. Our next speaker is Samer Muscati from Human Rights Watch. Hello, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Samer, and I'm the Associate Director for Disability Rights at Human Rights Watch, an independent non-government organization that monitors and reports on human rights abuses in more than 100 countries around the world, including in Canada. BC's decision to cancel its immigration detention contract with the Canada Border Services Agency that allowed provincial jails to be used for immigration detention is a clear victory for human rights. With this decision, the province will stop its involvement and complicity in the federal immigration detention system, which has time and again been shown to violate human rights with devastating impact on some of the most at-risk members of our communities. I want to express my sincere gratitude to the social justice, academic and grassroots organizations, as well as the thousands of people across Canada who called on BC authorities to make this very decision. I'd also like to express my deep gratitude to those like Abdul Rahman and Sarah speaking here today, who experienced immigration detention firsthand and generously shared their stories, insights and perspectives with us and the world. Some of the most serious human rights violations happen to people who are out of sight and out of mind, but your courage brought light to a place filled with obscurity. In the course of our research, one of the common themes in our interviews with people who experienced immigration detention was the shock they felt at being incarcerated on immigration grounds. Over the past five years, thousands of people were forced to endure some of the most restrictive conditions of confinement in Canada, including maximum security provincial jails, and did so without a countdown to a date of release. One of CBSA's most consequential powers within the immigration detention system is that the agency has full authority over where people are detained. Our research found that according to CBSA policy, the agency may incarcerate people with mental health conditions in provincial jails, specifically because of their mental health condition. This is clearly discriminatory. CBSA representatives justify this practice by claiming that people have access to specialized care in provincial jails and that their behavior can be better managed in those facilities. Instead of receiving vital support, people with psychosocial disabilities are subjected to disproportionately course of treatment and immigration detention. We've also spoken with people who express suicidal ideation while in immigration detention. And in response, authorities put them in solitary confinement. The immigration detention system stands in stark contradiction to the image many Canadians and people around the world have of this country as a welcoming multicultural safe haven. There is a rich fabric of community-based organizations that provide tailored and compassionate support services to newcomers but migrants and refugee claimants cannot access these services while they are in jail. Instead, many people are re-traumatized before they can even begin their lives in Canada. The devastating impact of immigration detention can last for months and years, and the consequences can ripple to people's loved ones as well. British Columbia's decision to stop allowing the federal government to use the province's jails for immigration detention represents one of the most significant clawbacks of CBSA's power since the agency was established nearly two decades ago. This decision should be an enormous wake up call to Canada's remaining provinces and the federal government that the immigration detention system is deeply flawed and untenable. When one of the largest provinces says that the human rights concerns are so grave that they are publicly canceling their contract with CBSA, the onus now shifts to the other provinces to explain why they remain a party to this horrible system. It's time for the other provinces to follow BC's example and end their complicity in the human rights violations taking place in the immigration detention system. It's time for Canada to get on the path to abolish immigration detention and ensure that people seeking safety or a better life are treated with humanity and dignity. Thank you. Thank you, Samer, for not only speaking about the human impact of immigration detention, but for calling on other provinces to take a stand as BC has done. Our next speaker is Julia Sand.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Julia Sand, and I'm here today on behalf of Amnesty International to celebrate an incredible human rights victory. Last week, the government of BC announced it was ending its arrangement with CBSA, meaning it will no longer allow people to be locked in its jails based solely on immigration grounds. The impacts of this decision cannot be overstated. Under the current system, CBSA officers have the discretion to determine whether to detain people in immigration holding centers or in provincial jails. This discretion has been exercised in ways that disproportionately impact people with mental health conditions, as well as Black and other racialized people. When the decision comes into effect, CBSA will no longer have the discretion to incarcerate people in BC jails. The worst conditions of detention will have ended in the province. British Columbia's decision to end its agreement with CBSA demonstrates a clear rejection of Canada's cruel practice of incarcerating people in jails based solely on immigration grounds. According to the government of BC, the decision was driven by their dedication to pursuing social justice and equity for all, considerations that should guide all government decisions. Given the government's finding that the arrangement with CBSA did not align with its commitment to upholding human rights standards, it is critical that it ends immediately after the 12 month notice period terminates. Any extension of this notice period would indefensibly prolong a practice that violates human rights standards and that has devastating impacts on the people who are detained, their loved ones and their communities. It is fundamentally unjust that people are detained in jails based solely on administrative immigration grounds. Amnesty International commends the government of BC for taking a stand against this harmful system. We urge the other provinces to follow suit by ending their arrangements with CBSA and call on the federal government to get on the path to abolishing immigration detention. Thank you. Julia, thank, for, thank you for your eloquent and insightful comments. Speaking next is Omar Chu. Thank you. Um, my name is Omar Chu and I'm the community legal worker at the Immigration and Refugee Legal Clinic, a BC clinic that deals with urgent and complex immigration and refugee matters. We were heartened to see the BC government commit to no longer detaining people on immigration grounds within 12 months. This is a big step towards recognizing that immigration detention is discriminatory, inhumane, and contrary to both principles of fundamental justice and Canada's obligations under international refugee law. We hope that other provinces will carefully consider these factors and that the federal government will also commit to stop detaining people under immigration law. Detention is often used to penalize migrants who are unable to maintain or restore their status, often for reasons well beyond their control. This includes being victim of fraud by immigration consultants, exploitative or discriminatory employers, poor working conditions, or falling out of status due to illness. Immigration detention penalizes those who Canada has failed to protect. I am the first point of contact for those seeking assistance from the Immigration Refugee Legal Clinic. And so it, I can see how heartbreaking and infuriating it is to hear the desperation and hopelessness that immigration detention creates. Immigration detention subjects people to quotes course of authority for indeterminate periods of time and under conditions of extreme uncertainty. Already displaced from their place of origin and having potentially traveled considerable distances at considerable risk to their safety and well-being, or in other situations after having already lived in Canada and made their home here for years, they're stripped of basic human rights and freedoms, including the freedom to make routine decisions about their day-to-day -day activities. Immigration detention also puts up huge barriers towards accessing effective legal counsel. Uh, detainees are largely required to obey orders and are in constant state of powerlessness against the authority of guards and immigration officials. While in immigration detention, they may be handcuffed, transported in prison vehicles, subjected to searches, kept under surveillance, and have their personal belongings confiscated. We look forward to the end of immigration detention in BC jails within 12 months and hope that this decision starts us on a new path towards ending immigration detention across Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Omar, for your remarks about how basic human rights and freedoms are affected by immigration detention and calling for a change across the country. 
Our next speaker is Dr. Mei-Ling Wiedemeyer. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Mei-Ling Wiedemeyer. As a primary care physician for migrants and refugees, I join my colleagues in welcoming the BC government's decision to end the province's immigration detention agreement with the federal government. In May of this year, I joined scores of mental health experts, doctors, nurses, social workers, healthcare providers, healthcare trainees, and health researchers across Canada to express alarm at the abusive practice of incarcerating individuals who are awaiting resolution of their immigration or refugee matters in Canada. This was not the first time that the healthcare community has come together to raise the alarm at the government's immigration detention system. In 2018, I joined more than 2,000 of my colleagues and dozens of organizations to call on the federal government to put an end to immigration detention. As a physician, I am appalled at CBSA's policy of using provincial jails to detain people with mental health conditions. CBSA's enforcement manual explicitly describes instability associated with mental imbalance and incorrectly from a medical perspective labels it a danger. In practice, this means that immigration detainees with conditions such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder or those who may be seen as suicidal can be incarcerated in provincial jails simply because of their health conditions or symptoms. This policy is discriminatory and profoundly inhumane. Simply put, jails are not healthcare facilities. And in this case, they are specifically harmful for people who are in the process of immigration refugee proceedings. The harmful mental health consequences of immigration detention are consistently recognized in medical literature in Canada and abroad. Imprisonment in a penal institution has adverse effects on health. And imprisonment of people with pre-existing mental health conditions, including those seen among survivors of trauma and persecution, is particularly troublesome. Refugee claimants and migrants are highly vulnerable to the toxic stress of incarceration in jails, where violence is widespread and lockdowns are frequent, as many have already experienced prolonged and repeated trauma, including torture or state violence in their countries of nationality. Incarceration, especially without an end in sight, thus becomes an ongoing threat to personal safety and health that detained people can neither escape nor overcome. Even for people with no previous trauma or pre-existing mental health conditions, being deprived of the basic human ability to control one's life can induce feelings of depression and hopelessness. Brief periods of time in immigration detention may add to the cumulative effect of trauma exposures leading to an increased likelihood of developing mental health conditions such as post-traumatic stress, depression, and anxiety. Given that there is no maximum time limit for how long people can be held for immigration reasons, they are at risk of indefinite detention. This protracted uncertainty has morbid implications for detainees' mental and physical health, especially within carceral settings. Since 2000, there have been at least 16 cases of immigration detainees who died through suicide or other reasons while in custody, and most of them were incarcerated in provincial jails. BC's decision to stop jailing immigration detainees represents a crucial step in the right direction. Now, other provinces must follow suit and put an end to this inhumane and harmful practice. But we should not stop there. Today, I once again join my colleagues to call on the federal government to abolish immigration detention. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Dr. Mayling Wiedemeyer. Our next speaker is the wonderful L. Jones. Good morning, everybody. My name is L. Jones, and I'm speaking to you from Halifax, Nova Scotia, the unceded and unsurrendered territories of the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet nations. Nova Scotia also has a history of enslavement, displacement, and erasure of African Nova Scotian people who also came to these territories in search of freedom and often found violence, repression, and indentured servitude instead. I first encountered the injustice of immigration punishment when working with a 16-year-old girl from the Congo, a victim of child trafficking and abuse held because her identification documents could not be located. 
I came to find out that this was only one case in hundreds of similar horrific stories taking place right in our communities. Since then, I have worked with terminally ill people unable to be released to die with their families, critically ill women shackled to their hospital beds, Afghan people fleeing war in container ships, and queer migrant workers seeking asylum, among many others. In one story, I was told, guards threw toilet paper onto the range and walked away, leaving them to fight for a basic hygiene product. Today, we are coming together to mark a significant and historic step in ending the agreement between the province of BC and CBSA that allows provincial jails to be used to incarcerate people without status who have committed no crimes. Ending provincial detention is an important step forward in dismantling border regimes and injustice. Immigration detention continues Canada's shameful histories of border criminalization, including Japanese internment, Chinese exclusion acts, the refusal of Jewish refugees in World War II, and many others. Immigration detention takes place in the context of broader human rights violations. CBSA is the only police force in Canada with no oversight, and we should all be troubled by the extent of their powers to operate unaccountably, with no avenue for complaint, and so often completely hidden from our sight. In Canada, over 100 children are held in detention. While many of us protested Trump's policies, most Canadians are not aware that indefinite detention exists right here in Canada. The inhumane conditions facing people without status are not limited to detention, and we must continue to work towards migrant justice for all and the rights of all incarcerated people. Today marks one more turn of the key in that lock. Over the years, we have had many reports of brutality and rights violations in detention. During COVID, hunger strikes in facilities such as Laval by detainees drove home the terrible conditions people face, often for simply moving their body from one place to another. People are held simply because they cannot locate their papers or they are deemed a flight risk. While capital and corporations move freely across borders, the poorest, most vulnerable people fleeing terrible conditions can be held in jail simply for seeking safety. In Robin Maynard's book, Policing Black Life, she recounts the story of a child raised in detention whose first words were radio check, which is what the guards would say during shift change. No country that calls itself just, free, or equal should have ever tolerated this. And we recognize that detention is a reflection of broader anti-immigrant, xenophobic, and racist narratives that designate people, particularly those from the global south, as a threat to the Canadian public. While today is a huge step forward, we must continue to fight for border justice for refugees and for migrants. Canada rightly opened our doors to Ukrainians but we often do not live up to our building as a place offering sanctuary. So many injustices from former child refugees in the child welfare system facing deportation to the lack of access to healthcare for those without status still remain, and we must continue to fight until all are welcome and equal in Canada. If we do not address these underlying narratives and policies that criminalize migrants, immigrants, and refugees, the will to punish those without status and falsely position them as a danger will remain. We must not create private detention regimes as a so-called progressive replacement. For-profit immigration detention in the US has a long documented history of horrific rights violations. Our goal is not to shift the side of incarceration, but to recognize detention as an unnecessary and inhumane response. Along with recognizing the step forward taken today, we recognize these conditions remain across Canada. I call upon the government of Nova Scotia and all other provinces to follow suit. There should be no place in Canada where children are detained on immigration. There should be no place where poor people and workers are abused, stripped of their rights and without meaningful redress. Canada cannot claim to be a human rights leader while maintaining an unjust regime of detention, deportation and unaccountability. Please join us in this campaign across Canada and end this practice forever. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elle, for speaking so clearly about immigration detention from a prison justice lens. Our final speaker today is Sarah Maria Gomez Lopez. Hi, good morning. Hello, my name is Sarah Maria Gomez Lopez. I want to speak today about what BC's decision means to me personally and what a monumental victory this is for many of us. 
I arrived in Canada in 2012 to seek refugee protection. In the past 10 years, I've experienced the best of what Canada has to offer, but also I experienced the worst of what authorities try to hide. In 2012, I was staying in a welcome center in Vancouver when CBSA officers came to see me. They asked me to step outside and arrest me as soon as my feet were off the premises. I spent a single day of freedom as a refugee claimant before I was placed in immigration detention. The CBSA officer handling my case was aggressive. He said, get ready to be deported because Canada deports 98% of Mexicans. He decided I did not deserve protection before even hearing my story. My refugee claim was eventually approved and today I live and work in Vancouver. I never understood why CBSA arrested me. I never understood why CBSA incarcerated me in, a, in the Alouette Correctional Center for Women in Maple Ridge, a maximum security provincial jail. No one explained the rules and there was not interpretation support in jail. I was expected to automatically know and be by the rules or risk punishment. I turned it into an inmate, a number, a faces, nobody. I remained in immigration detention for three months. A few months after I was released from jail, a woman named Lucia Vega Jimenez took her life in immigration detention. She was from Mexico, like me. She also spent part of her detention at the Alouette jail. Behind those walls, I came close to losing my hope, but I held on. Lucia was not as lucky, and it hurts to think about how many others lose their hope, their faith in Canada, and even their lives because of immigration detention. Last week, when I heard about the BC's decision to stop jailing immigration detainees, I wasn't overjoyed. That day, was exactly 12 years after I fled Mexico. I felt like a, one of the most difficult chapters in my life finally closed. I thought about Lucia. I thought about my cellmates who were with me in immigration detention. I thought, and I thought about all the people I've, I've supported that will never be jailed in BC simply for seeking safety or a better life in this country. This is a huge victory for human rights. 10 years have passed since I experienced human rights violations in Canada. And finally, we were here as a part of the justice that everyone deserves. I'm honored to have joined this amazing team. I would like to thank all those who support this campaign all the human rights organizations, the healthcare providers, the lawyers and academic scholars, the faith leaders and the advocates. I hope other provinces will follow BC's example and give way to the human welcome that has helped heal so many who found refuge in this country. Thank you. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. I know that I'm not the only one here who is extremely moved and appreciative of your care and openness. We'll now proceed to some questions. The floor is now open to journalists to pose questions for our speakers. If your question is for Abdel Rahman Al Mahdi or for Sarah Maria Gomez Lopez, we ask that you put your questions in the chat. Otherwise, please raise your hand to request to be unmuted. All right. Our first question is for Samar Miscotti from Human Rights Watch. 
The question is, what is next for the campaign to end immigration detention in provincial jails, given that BC is only the first prov province to do so? Thank you, Megan. Uh, so this is really a, uh, a turning point in the campaign. You know, it's a huge deal that one of the provinces has now canceled their immigration detention contract with the CBSA, specifically citing human rights concerns uh, in doing so. So the question is, why are the other provinces still remaining in these arrangements with the CBSA? when clearly there is, uh, there is uh, evidence beyond human rights organizations that these violations are occurring. So in terms of next steps, we're actively campaigning in Nova Scotia and Quebec, really pushing those governments to cancel their contracts. Uh, and we're hoping to focus on Ontario in the coming months as well. Ultimately, it's uh, the federal government that has sole legal responsibility for border enforcement and immigration detention. So uh, the question is, why are provincial governments selling their own reputations by getting their hands dirty in this awful business. It doesn't make any sense. And we hope that, that they will agree. Uh, at the same time, we're advocating with the federal government uh, continuously in the hopes that they will cancel all of these uh, contracts at once, rather than have the provinces pull out in this uh, piecemeal cancellation process. Thank you. Our second question is, what do you think the federal government will do now as this process moves forward? I can hop in and answer that one um, to start. Our hope is that um, the federal government will just recognize that these immigrants and refugee claimants are often either already established in Canada in communities, they have lived here for years, sometimes even decades, or are coming to Canada with established communities to welcome, and that they can be released or remain in those communities and in their homes that they've already established here. So we're hoping that there's a recognition that um, detainees do not need to be detained and do not need to be subjected to any so-called alternatives to detention and can just remain in the communities that support them and the homes that have sustained them for the time that they've been in Canada thus far. So that's one of our hopes that we have, um, if anybody else had anything to add. Perhaps I can uh, just add that such an action would not be unprecedented. So early on in, during the pandemic, authorities did release people who were held in immigration detention at unprecedented rates. And so this is something that Canada has done and something that can continue. Uh, I would also note that the practice of incarcerating people in provincial jails is quite costly. So I believe last year, uh, the federal government paid BC a $253 per diem for each person who is held in BC jails. And so that's a huge cost and those funds can instead be used to support uh, community-based organizations that provide compassionate and tailored support services to people uh, who are currently held in immigration detention. Thank you. I would like to thank our speakers for sharing their knowledge and experience about immigration detention and everyone who took the time to be with us here today, including jo those joining us over live stream. Thank you for joining us and 